Politicians and pundits on both the left and the right in America have been using national security to justify some major changes in U.S. industrial policy. Both sides are wrong, according to our next guest. Scott Lincecum is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Libertarian Cato Institute, and he has a new report with this title, Manufactured Crisis, Deindustrialization, Free Markets, and National Security. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Thanks for joining us. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Um, it it turned out to be a quite timely topic. I started writing the paper uh, really uh, in early 2020, and uh, then the pandemic happened, and all of a sudden, not only were we use were politicians and pundits using China as the excuse for all this industrial policy, but also COVID 19. Um, and really, you know, as you mentioned, the, the thesis is that. Um, Decades of deindustrialization have supposedly uh, destroyed the country's ability to make stuff and how this was a, a threat to national security in the U.S.-China context, but now also a threat to U.S. national security uh, in this context of COVID-19, our inability to make uh, medical goods, pharmaceuticals, uh, PPE, and all of these things. And and the truth is, when you dig into the data, there's, there's not a lot of truth to, to those claims. I suspect, though, that most people who remember at the beginning of the pandemic that it was hard to get a mask yeah. or hard to get some of these other things probably find some truth in that and say, wait a minute, uh, this sounds right. America is not able to get this stuff quickly. These these guys are on the right track. Exactly. And and let's face it, uh, the narrative of uh, deindustrialization in the United States, uh, the idea we don't make anything anymore, is a really common one in the political discourse dating back decades. Um, and and like, like you said, I mean, it really became prominent once COVID hit, particularly in March and April when our, our grocery store shelves were, were bare. Uh, the problem with that theory or that narrative is, well, really twofold. Uh, in the broader context, if you look at the manufacturing data itself, what you see is that the U.S. manufacturing sector, in terms of the things we care about when we talk about national security and the country's ability to make stuff, um, actually the manufacturing sector is doing quite well uh, in terms of output, in terms of value added, investment, uh, financial performance. All of these things over the last 20 plus years have gone up for the, uh, for the U.S. economy and the U.S. manufacturing sector. And so I think actually, you know, North Carolina is a great example of that. Um, if you look at the state of the North Carolina manufacturing sector, you know, a lot of people, when they think of North Carolina, they think furniture and textiles. Oh, well, we don't make uh, T-shirts. We don't make furniture anymore, at least not in the same quantities. So we must have lost all of that manufacturing capacity. And of course, we have lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. The reality is, again, if you look at the data from the, from the U.S. government, you see that North Carolina's manufacturing output over the last couple decades is up. The difference, and this is uh, the same with the U.S. manufacturing sector as a whole, is that there's been a lot of churn in the types of stuff we make due to either globalization or changing consumer tastes or whatever. And you see that in the data for the nation as a whole and for North Carolina. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, for example, we did make a lot of textiles. We did make a lot of furniture. These days, we make a lot more of aerospace and motor vehicles and uh, some food products as well. And that changing uh, structure of the manufacturing sector with, and, and, in, and including uh, changing regional structure. So industries moving from the Rust Belt and the industrial Midwest to moving to the South, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and the rest, that we see that that disruption and we think, ah, nothing is replacing. But in the sector, actually, there is a lot replacing it still. Now, you've just spelled out some of the facts that counter the narrative, yeah. but yet the narrative has led to this uh, phenomenon that uh, you refer to as a resurgent security nationalism. Right. Tell us about that and the problems that creates. Right. So the security nationalism thesis is that this deindustrialization I just mentioned has left us very vulnerable, vulnerable to China, vulnerable to pandemics and other national emergencies. Uh, the other thing that apparently, supposedly has made us vulnerable is a free market fundamentalism and the lack of any government policies that exist to protect or support our manufacturing sector. <clears throat> and so we've already gone over the deindustrialization part. That part is, is generally false, although, of course, again, there's been this churn. Um, but the other 
falsehood there is that we have lots of policies. We have lots of laws in place that allow the U.S. government to protect specific sectors through tariffs or subsidies or quotas or buy American rules and the rest. And then we also have a lot of other laws that allow, for example, the Department of Defense, since we're talking about national security, to actually uh, directly fund the production of specific goods. And the DOD every year produces these big reports. And generally what DOD has found is that they utilize these laws occasionally, but overall there is no grand need for even more subsidization. Uh, the other problem that is unmentioned by the kind of security nationalist group is that because we have these laws in place, we have a lot of case studies of security nationalism in practice. So look, the theoretical case for national security protectionism and industrial policy is sound. The, even libertarians and free marketers like me would say, look, um, occasionally um, for national security purposes, we need to abandon our quest for free market efficiency and consumer value, and we need to just simply subsidize or protect certain sectors on national security grounds. However, in practice is where things get trickier. And what we see again from this history is that in case after case after case, uh, security nationalism doesn't work very well. Not only does it impose ex ex immense economic costs for U.S. consumers, for the U.S. government, but it also doesn't tend to produce uh, or achieve its objectives, um, whether that is, for example, producing a robust and thriving domestic shipbuilding industry. Um, we have the Jones Act, which protects, uh, radically protects and restricts uh, foreign shipping uh, between U.S. ports. So you can't, for example, uh, sh use a foreign ship, a foreign-made ship to ship something from, say, Wilmington to Boston. You have to use an American ship. Well, that is, of course, a direct uh, subsidy to the shipbuilding industry in the United States. The problem, and it's, and it's on express national security grounds. The problem however, is that the Jones Act has been in place for 100 years, and all we've seen over that time is a slow and steady decline in the number of ships that are available for our merchant marine and in the shipbuilding industry as well. So some of the facts about deindustrialization are quite wrong. This security nationalism goes in the wrong direction. If we want to place ourselves in the best position to deal with some of these threats in the future, right. what should we do? Right. So the last part of the paper really explores, well, look, so if security nationalism doesn't work, what should we do to help the manufacturing sector, help the national economy, and bolster national security? And it turns out there are actually a lot of things we could do to bolster national security and the manufacturing sector. For example, right now we have all sorts of tariffs in place on industrial inputs. And by industrial inputs, I mean the stuff our manufacturers actually use to produce other stuff. Steel, aluminum, and all sorts of other uh, inputs, machinery, and the rest that these manufacturers need. Well, studies have shown that these tariffs actually have shrunk the size of not just the manufacturing sector, but also a manufacturing workforce. In other words, they're costing us jobs as well. Everybody cares about jobs. So lifting those tariffs would be an immediate boost to the U.S. economy and to the manufacturing sector. Uh, another area that's ripe for reform is in immigration. So past studies have shown, for example, that restrictions on high-skill immigration, uh, so these are kind of educated foreign workers, those restrictions have actually caused multinational manufacturers to offshore their research and development activities and to offshore their production facilities. If they can't get the talent they need, then they're just going to go elsewhere. Doubling that problem is that they aren't just going to Canada. They're going to some of our uh, less friendly countries like China. So it's a double whammy. We're not getting the production here, the research and development here in the United States, but we're also helping China uh, bolster its industrial capacity. So that's doubly bad. And I think the last one that's really important to note is uh, tax reform. So we've done some things in the corporate tax area in the, at the federal level, but we've still left a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit. And one area would be to let manufacturers and all companies really uh, expense or write off any investments they make for uh, facilities, for factories, for machinery, and the rest immediately. Right now, they have to write those off over a long period. Now, the 2017 tax reform law allowed that to be temporarily suspended, but it snaps back soon. And as anybody knows, you don't invest for a couple years, you invest in the long term, particularly for a factory. So by simply allowing for what we call full expensing, you would do another, you would give the manufacturing sector yet another shot in the arm. 
Sounds like the shorthand is government, please get out of the way and we'll be able to cope better with all of these issues. We're, yes, we're, we'd be, we're doing okay now, but we could be doing a lot better if we removed a lot of these tax regulatory uh, restrictions that are really hamstringing uh, the sector and the American worker. The title of the report, once again, is Manufactured Crisis, Deindustrialization, Free Markets, and National Security. Its author is Scott Lincecum, who's a senior fellow in economic studies at the libertarian Cato Institute. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.